Hi, everyone, and welcome to Writing the West, a conversation with Sarah Hulse and Larry Watson. My name is China Reavers, and I'm here on behalf of the Montana Book Festival, which would have been able to move forward this year without our sponsor, the Whitefish Review, and our other sponsors. So thank you for your support. We're really excited to welcome our authors to this year's virtual festival, but I want to first share a few notes. We'd like to welcome you, our attendees, and have you submit your questions and comments to our authors via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Sarah Captaville is here on hand to read your questions and pass them along to our panel. Rest assured, we are seeing you. Feel free to use the chat function as well to talk amongst yourselves while the event is taking place. Sarah will be monitoring both the Q&A and the chat for questions. And with that, I'd like to introduce our authors. Sarah Hulse's first novel, Black River, was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award for Debut Fiction, an ABA Indies introduced title, an indie next pick, and the winner of the of the reading, excuse me, of the Reading the West Book Award. Hulse received her MFA from the University of Oregon and was a fiction fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. An avid horsewoman, she has lived throughout the American West. Raised in Bismarck, North Dakota, Larry Watson is the author of 10 critically acclaimed books, including the best-selling Montana 1948. His fiction has been published internationally and has received numerous prizes and awards. His essays and book reviews have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Sun-Times, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and other periodicals. He and his wife live in Kenosha, Wisconsin. A film adaptation of Watson's novel, Let Him Go, is currently in production with Kevin Costner and Diane Lane and due to release in 2020. And with that, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hi, Larry. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Very well. Very well. So we um, we talked a few minutes ago about we I think we each have a really short little reading we might want to start off with before we, we jump into the conversation. Sure. Uh, so do you want to do you want to go ahead with that? Um, sure, I'll be happy to. I'm going to read from um, the lives of Edie Pritchard uh, novel that just came out in July. Um, I'll just say a few words about the book. It's, um, it's in three sections and each of the sections uh, features Edie Pritchard um, uh, when she is 24, 44, and 64. And those sections are in 1967, 1987, and uh, 2007. Um, and so much of the novel is about how Edie's character changes and maybe more importantly, how it doesn't change uh, over the decades. Uh, but there is um, a conflict there that's um, that remains throughout her life. And that's that she, she struggles to be seen for who she is. Uh, she's a pretty woman and um, her, her looks often uh, blind people to some of her, her um, more exemplary features. She's also strong, she's smart, she's brave, she's hardworking. Um, and uh, people continually underestimate her. Uh, uh, each of those sections too features a road trip. Um, Edie was born and raised in, in my fictional community of Gladstone, Montana. And um, in the first section, she finally becomes um, sort of fed up with her husband and his twin brother. And um, she leaves Gladstone and um, it's one of those departures that um, she goes to the bus station and she says, when's the first bus leaving? And they wanna know what direction are you headed? And she says, I don't care, just get me on the first bus. So this is Edie on the bus. Edie has been on the bus less than an hour and its easy bounce and sway are already transporting her towards sleep. Looping the strap around her wrist, she tucks her purse close to her side and away from the aisle, then closes her eyes. But in another moment, she's jarred back to consciousness. 
A large woman in a man's wool overcoat is lurching up the aisle toward the front of the bus. She's waving her arms and yelling, wait, stop, we have to stop. When she reaches the driver, she bends down to tell him something. Edie can't hear what the woman says, but the driver extends an arm in an attempt to calm her and move her back toward her seat. His effort is in vain, however. She continues to hover near him and to plead her case. In another moment, the bus slows and the driver steers the vehicle to the side of the road. The vehicle leans, totters, and finally stops, half on the blacktop and half on the crumbling shoulder. The driver shuts off the engine and pulls on the emergency brake. He stands and turns to face the bus passengers. Folks, we have a little situation. This lady has forgotten her medication in her luggage and it's medication she says she needs. So we'll dig out her suitcase, get her pills, and we'll be on our way again. Feel free to step out and stretch your legs. Edie follows everyone else off the bus, but while they gather near the driver as he opens the luggage compartment, she walks behind the bus and stands by herself on the cracked, frost-heaved blacktop. It might not seem like much, this country. A few bare hills, each seeming to rise out of the shadow of the one behind it, miles of empty prairie, and all of it, hill and plain, the color of paper left out in the sun. You might be out here alone someday with what you thought would be your life, and a gust of wind might blow your heart open like a screen door and slam it just as fast. There. Thank you. Well, I also have a, a short little section I can read from Eden Mine. Um, this book follows uh, a young woman named Jo, um, whose older brother, Samuel, at the very beginning of the novel, um, sets off a bomb at a courthouse. And Joe's known for a long time that Samuel has, has kind of been, you know, involved with some extremist thought and ideas, um, but she's kind of always played that down in her own mind. So part of this book is her coming to terms um, with the fact that someone she loves very much and who has, has very often been very good to her, um, has done this, this really terrible thing. Um, they live in a small town in northwestern Montana, um, also a fictional town. Um, and one of the kind of time pressures in this book is that the home she and her brother have lived on all their lives is being seized by the state um, for an eminent domain. So there's kind of a bit of a countdown as she is trying to um, pack up this house, decide what to do with her life, and all the while her brother has gone missing after this bombing. Um, and there, there's a bit of a question as to where he is and also whether Joe knows where he is. So I'm just gonna read from the very beginning of the book. My brother's bomb explodes at 10.16 on a late April Sunday morning. I don't know. I'm 150 miles Northwest in the house he and I share. I've just taped together the first cardboard moving box and it sits on the hardwood before me, yawning empty. Later, I'll imagine the explosion with such regularity and intensity the details become etched in my mind alongside my own memories, sharp-edged and indelible. I'll be hounded by those details, haunted. The shattering glass, thousands of jagged pieces slicing the air, capturing and fracturing the light. The enormity of the sound, the brute physicality of it, and then its numbing absence. The clouding dust, the crumbling rubble, the blood. But at 1016, I know nothing, packing my biggest problem. 12 injured, one critically, a child, the daughter of the pastor of the church across the street from the bomb. Service is barely begun, only the first hymn sung, the first reading spoken. The child's father prays over her for the three minutes it takes her to lose consciousness, for the four minutes more it takes the paramedics to arrive. He cradles her as he prays, and he'll find flecks of red on his skin and under his nails for days afterward. So much blood, he will say, so fast. I don't know any of this. There's no tingle at the back of my neck, no sudden catch of breath at the moment of detonation. I have no idea, none, until the radio cuts off the newest country star in the midst of his climb up the weekly countdown, replaces his easy twang with the clipped voice of a reporter. If my gut contracts when I hear the word courthouse, 
It is only because we got bad news there not long ago. If I try calling Samuel's cell phone and then try again and again, it is simply because a person wants to talk to family after a disaster like this, and he is the only family I have. And if what I feel when the knock comes and I open the door to the sheriff is not exactly surprise, well, that's just the shock. Well, wow. that's such a wonderful opening. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes I, I use things like this as an example for students or readers where I say, you know, yes, I write literary fiction, but I still can, you know, blow things up on the first page. Plot, plot is allowed. <laughs> yeah. uh, and do and you want to say something about your decision to blow it up right on the first page? I mean, uh, plenty of writers would spend an awful lot of pages working up to the uh, explosion. Yeah, and, you know, this is, this is something I was actually thinking about getting ready for this. I think, you know, we, we both have written about kind of violence in these small communities. And, and I think one of the reasons I do start with it on the first page is that, you know, I'm, I'm less interested in the actual event. You know, it's, it's not so much the thing that happens when the news cameras are there, so to speak, but what happens when they leave. Um, and I'm, I'm really kind of interested, I think, in the ways these, these violent acts, you know, there was, there was one in my first book too, a prison riot, um, affect the people involved, you know, the people directly involved, the people who interact with those people or love those people, the communities, kind of, um, I think one of the reviews of Eden Mind said it was something like, you know, I'm less concerned with the blast than the blast radius, and I think there's some truth to that. So in a sense, um, you know, getting, getting right to it kind of let me shift my interest in this novel kind of directly to, to where they really were for the book, which was not so much the bombing and the man who did it as this woman who loves him and is telling the story of the novel. Yeah, oh, that's very, I, I, I like that a lot, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I feel the same way. I'm, I'm uh, more interested in uh, the effects of violence or even sometimes the way people feel the presence of violence in in some of these uh, communities. I I um, did an interview early earlier this summer with a, a, a for a book blog in England, and um, the host said, "Those guns, those all those guns," <laughs> and and he just couldn't imagine the presence of so many guns. And I said, "Yeah, it's true, it's true," and of course just having them around always escalates something. It doesn't make any difference if people are, are bringing them out. Just to know that they are nearby means that there is a potential for violence to be, to be deadly. Yeah, I'm um, always kind of interested, I think, or realizing I'm, I'm interested because I keep writing about it in these the sort of ways people and, and the characters, you know, that, that we write who live and grow up in the West are kind of affected by these, these stories that have been told about the West and these ideas and mythologies we have and the ways those kind of butt up against reality. And I think, you know, some of what you're talking about there, the, the prevalence of the guns and the potential for violence, you know, some of that, of course, has very practical purposes and the ways in which they've been used as, as tools throughout, you know, the history of the West, while also kind of playing into some of these ideas of, you know, the white hats, the black hats, you know, frontier independence, um, you know, with this book in particular, I was really interested in sort of where do the positive aspects of maybe that frontier mentality or that independent Western spirit bleed into these things that allow for violence to boil over or, or for extremism. So I think sometimes as a storyteller, it's interesting to tell stories about people who, who have kind of been impacted by these, these stories that have been told for so long about this region. Oh, uh, I, uh, I agree. I mean, uh, um, I don't know how often we, we read reviews of books that, that say that they uh, are exploding the myth of the American West or something like that. But uh, that's an explosion that just keeps going on <laughs> all the time. I mean, uh, and yet the, the, some of those American West myths persist. I think uh, it might have been Larry McMurtry who called them zombie myths. They just refuse to die. And even if the characters aren't living them out or are living lives that are, are far from the mythic Western cowboy life or something like that, they're still sort of hovering just outside. Uh, 
um, you know, I, I don't think of my fiction as being about the great outdoors so much as the great indoors, but, but, um, but that big sky is just outside, just outside the door. I think something related to that I also see us both sort of writing about is, you know, kind of how, you know, gender fits into that. You know, we've both sort of written from the perspective of both men and women. Um, and I'm always interested, you know, with my first book, um, I sometimes even wonder my first book is from the perspective of a male character and my second is from the perspective of a woman. Um, and I actually wonder sometimes if my publisher would have asked me to go by S.M. Hulse had my first book been from a woman's point of view. Um, as sort of a side note, you know, that was something I was asked to do for a kind of gender neutral author title on the cover. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how have you thought about that in your writing in the sense of maybe like what is expected of the Western man or the Western woman or what other people expect of them? And, you know, how does that play out in your thinking about your characters? Um, yeah, I, um, in, in, uh, in my, the novel that came out before Edie Pritchard, As Good As Gone, um, I think it was uh, a, a bit more explicit. I had a character in there, uh, Calvin Sidey, who who really was a, a cowboy and and conformed to some of the dimensions of the myth. Although he was intent on on exploding those myths, he wanted nothing to do with them. Um, you know, some of it I I've taken from my own life. My grandfather was a cowboy in, in Eastern Montana and Western North Dakota. And, um, and I liked uh, cowboy movies and television shows when I was a kid, but I knew that there was the distance of the Grand Canyon between those, those uh, characters and who my grandfather was. And, and he would have laughed if you would have, anyone would have suggested to him that he was some kind of American archetype. You know, he was just uh, trying to get by. And um, he was proudest of the time in his life when he stopped being a cowboy and settled down and uh, homesteaded in, in North Dakota and raised a, a, a family and was instrumental in starting a community. Which is probably gone now. Which is uh, another American Western story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was. It's kind of something I was thinking about as as well. And Eden Mine is, you know, one of the things that my protagonist Joe really reckons with is the fact that her home is kind of a dying town. It's a mining town where the mines closed almost around the time she was born, so she never even really saw it in its heyday. Um, and she's, you know, now that she's being forced off her home, she's kind of reckoning with these ideas of what, what is home, what is the importance of physical place. Um, she's a character who lives with a physical disability. She uses a wheelchair, so it's really not an easy place for her to live in many ways, but she finds herself extremely reluctant to leave. Um, and that was, that was kind of interesting for me to explore where, you know, these, these ideas, you know, again, going back to that myth, right? I mean, sometimes I think people you know, think of Montana or, or some of these other Western places, kind of like the vacation brochure. And of course, those of us who know them well know there's, you know, a lot of places that don't look anything like that. Um, if they ever did, they certainly don't now. Um, and, and just kind of looking at that question was really interesting. You know, how can you sort of watch these things come and go and, you know, put everything you have into them, knowing they might not survive and still loving them and and hating them too. So it was, it was an interesting question to explore. And I think something most people who have lived in some part of the West have kind of wrestled with themselves on some level. Yeah, I, um, I, I thought it was really interesting that you did have a character in, in your novel who um, doesn't climb on a horse, but climbs on a mule and rides off into the mountains, but it's a female and she has to get out of a wheelchair in order to get onto that mule and ride up into the mountains. I've, I just thought she was a wonderful character, and uh, and and I like the mule a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all about the mule. I was <laughs> I'm you know like they said in the bio, I'm definitely kind of a, a horse person. So there had to there had to be some kind of equine. So it was this time it was the long ears. But um, yeah, it was it was interesting. You know, I mean, it, when you were introducing 
you know, your novel, you were talking about Edie kind of being people not seeing who she really is um, and seeing certain things on the outside and in kind of a different way. I think, you know, my character Joe's experiencing that same thing um, where other people kind of look at our characters and assume certain things or see certain things about them. And, you know, that was very interesting to, to sort of write characters who understand how they're being perceived by others and, and recognize that that's not who they are. Uh, she she's also a tough character, um, but has her own special kind of of uh, toughness. Um, uh, I was also really interested that your novel engaged um, some really big ideas uh, about religion and about um, I think it's fair to say to say politics. But um, it never, it never really argued them, even though those they were they were sort of always present in the novel and in the characters, and and uh, but you you weren't interested in in taking a stand, were you? Oh, excuse me. No, I mean I think you know I'm certainly interested in in writing about kind of forgiveness and the challenges of that and the you know potential rewards and ramifications of it. So, I mean, that's perhaps the closest, you know, I come to that. Um, but I, you know, I, I do sometimes feel like in a lot of contemporary American fiction, you know, Christianity in particular is kind of either, particularly Protestant Christianity is either kind of absent or presented satirically, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it's, it's fine, but it's, it's so much a part of, you know, many people's lives that it's, it's kind of interesting to me to see that on the page. And in Eden Mine, you know, one of the characters is the pastor of the church um, whose daughter is injured in this explosion very severely. Um, and, it, you know, the relationship between Joe and this pastor Asa was really interesting to me because they are coming from such different worldviews. You know, Joe is maybe agnostic. You know, she, she has never, I think, even thought to put a label on her own belief system, probably. It's just not that present in her life. It's, it's something they did growing up because it was what you did in this town, um, more, more of a social exercise than anything. And, you know, the book in general, I think, is, is looking at belief. Why do we believe what we do? Why does her brother come to believe in these, you know, sort of terrible extremist political ideas? Um, why does, you know, Joe's very prop, this pastor, she comes to realize, believes that he once healed someone by the laying on of hands. And Joe's reaction to this is kind of like, I wish he hadn't told me that, essentially. She would, her initial reaction is basically like, I would rather not know that this person I'm kind of coming to like and respect believes that this happened. It's just such a far cry from her own belief system that it's hard for her to understand. Um, and so it's, you know, I really enjoyed kind of digging into these questions of why do some people believe certain things? You know, there's a line in the book that she's wondering something about why does tra tragedy essentially steal faith from some people, but kind of bolster it in others. And, you know, it's not a question that's answered in the book. It's not a question I think, you know, really could be answered satisfactorily in, in a book. Um, but it is an interesting thing and an important thing, I think, to see the characters reckon with and um, wonder about and to see kind of the diversity of belief among these people who are brought together in this book. Yeah, uh, you also, uh, I, I like your sheriff a lot too. Um, uh, I've also, <laughs> I also have a number of sheriffs in my uh, yes. uh, fiction. Um, I, I, I came to my sheriffs um, uh, through my family, my father and grandfather were both sheriffs in a small town in in North Dakota, and um, your sheriff is just a really solid guy. I mean, I was uh, I, I was rooting for him um, throughout the novel. I, I appreciate that. And yes, I have to be a little bit of a fan for a minute. That means so much to me as someone who still has my copies of, you know, Montana 1948 and Justice on my shelf that I was given when I was much younger and just was like, I want to write a book like this someday. So, so thank you. That That's my personal blurb right there. I appreciate that, Larry. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, again, it kind of played into that a bit what you were talking about earlier that I can concept some of these people have of themselves and what other people have, right? 
who are you if you're the Western lawman, right? Well, you're a person, you're an individual, you have, you know, a lot of things going on. And I, I liked that this character was kind of consciously or unconsciously almost grabbing onto that stereotype and using it kind of as a, a model for himself. I think, you know, many people do that. They find something to emulate that they want to be, even if they know on some level it's maybe unrealistic. And we start to see over the course of the novel the ways in which that isn't working for for Sheriff Hawkins in my book. Um, but yeah, I just it's even even in writing him, you just kind of wanted things to work out. So one thing I did, you know, shifting gears just a little bit, you know, we both kind of mentioned earlier um, that you know we we've kind of created fictional towns to write in. So can you can you talk a little bit about like why you why you choose to do that? Why make up a place? Yeah. Um. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, uh, I've, I've uh, Edie Pritchard, as I mentioned earlier, is from um, Gladstone, Montana. Uh, she goes up to Bent Rock, and I've used Bent Rock in a number of, of fictions. Uh, part of it is so that I can make these places my own, um, so I can situate them in uh, geographically, but because I'm not writing about Glendive or Westby or something like that. I'm I'm free to fictionalize the communities, and um, if you do that, you can make up the details that you need for the story, and yet you don't have to, and you don't have to worry that somebody's going to read it and say, "Well, wait a minute, no, the, the that's not where the Dairy Queen is. The Dairy Queen's over in Washington. <laughs> you know, he's he's got his geography all wrong or something." Um, and um, and then also once you you create these these communities, um, I, I feel it's a little like uh, you know uh, waste not want not. I mean I've gone to the trouble of, of, of building Gladstone, and I sort of know the layout of the community. Um, uh, I guess I'll just keep using it. And and John Updike once said something about about his fictional region that he kept returning to. He said, once you know um, I, I, something like the, the fundamental feasibilities of a place, you can imagine freely there. And I think to me, that means that if you know sort of how things work in this place, maybe you don't even have to explain them. You can just go ahead and imagine people living out their lives in those places. Where, where, by the way, is your fictional community? <laughs> well, I Can you give you know, it away. <laughs> well, it's so funny, you know, what you say, kind of about the waste not want not about Gladstone, because I've only, you know, of course, written these two books, and I didn't really expect some of the fictional places I created in my first book, Black River, to show up in Eden Mine, but then they did because I was like, well, it's not the exact same town, but I had made a city, Elk Fork, which everyone, many of the people who have read it watching go, so it's basically Missoula, right? And, you know, I always say kinda, um, but it was, you know, conveniently located and I knew where some stuff was, so it ended up in this book too. Um, it was it was more you know of a decision for me with my first book. It's very much about a prison riot, um, but I created this fictional town of Black River, which certainly shares some characteristics with Deer Lodge. Um, there are you know details about it and about the prisons that are very much you know quote unquote real. Um, but I needed a riot to be at a time when one hadn't taken place, and I needed the details of it to be somewhat different than they are in reality. Um, so it, it almost seemed like the decision was made for me. Well, I have to change this a little bit and I wanted to make it more of an insular community and smaller and geographically different. I occasionally go to readings in Montana and have people accuse me of like moving mountain ranges. And it's like, yes, but it's called something different. So you can't prove, you know, that those are the bitter roots, the sapphires, whatever. Um, and then the, the one this time is, is very much kind of way up there uh, near Canada, Northwest Montana. So in, in a nice detailed in its own description, but slightly vague in where would you actually put it on the map, which was kind of just how I needed it to be, so. Yeah. Uh, and, and having Joe as an artist is just a terrific way to describe the landscape and yet to sort of do it in a subjective way, especially when her art 
changes over the course of the novel. I, I just thought that was uh, that was wonderful. I mean, we so we saw we saw the change in her art, and then it went back to her, and we realized something about the change in her. Um, in the same way, yeah, it was. Yeah, I liked that a lot. Well, thank you. Yeah, I sometimes joke I, you know, made her an artist so that I would have an excuse to like write really gushy long paragraphs about mountains, which I love to do, but perhaps shouldn't always do. Um, so it gave me a, a means by which to do that. But I, I am really interested in writing about like other forms of creative expression. And I think a good chunk of that is just jealousy. Like my first book was about a musician. This one's about an artist. I'm neither of those things, but really wish I were. Um, you know, I, I took a painting class while writing this one and kind of confirmed that's not my calling, um, but it was it was useful. But it was it was just a it was a means to kind of deal, I guess, especially with a book where I do have a character who's so isolated so much of the time. She's, you know, thinking about stuff by herself a lot, which is, of course, I think a little bit of a trap sometimes for any writer who who also would like readers to turn the page someday. Um, and it, it did allow me to sort of let her think through these things, who is she? It is in some ways a coming of age narrative for her. Um, and we, I think we see some of that through her art and she, she does use that to kind of identify the ways in which she's thinking about her place and the people around her. Um, so it was, it was really interesting to learn about that process and then try to convey it on the page in a way that, that made sense. You know, um, I think other authors understand one of the best little notes I got after it came out was from someone who like was an artist and said, you got all the art stuff right. And even if I got like 10 more later that say you got all the art stuff wrong, I'm just gonna remember the one that said I got it right. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I also uh, uh, had an artist as a main character in a novel once. And I think I, um, you know, I, I had some artistic impulses that is drawing and painting when I was younger and nothing much came of it. So I, I, I think I, I created the paintings in words that I could never create on a canvas or something like that. And maybe it's, it's something about that you feel a connection to an artistic personality, sensibility, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I learned to play the fiddle while I was writing my first book, um, which I had chosen because I needed like some sort of old timey bluegrassy instrument and I played the viola like really horrifically badly as a kid. Um, some people would say it's the only way to play the viola, but they're they're wrong. Um, and it, you know, it was it was fun. I still do play it. Um, but essentially what I realized with that was sort of like I can mimic things really well. Like if my, you know, instructor at the time had showed me how to play a tune, I could play it just like he did. I mean, not quite as well, but I could make it sound like that. But then he could go off and improvise in these amazing ways that I still, you know, absolutely cannot do if I attempted. It. it just sort of collapses in a heap of notes that are not attractive and do not please my cat. Um, but it is, you know, so that's that's been interesting to me and just trying some of these other artistic things and saying, you know, I enjoy this. It's a fun hobby, but it doesn't feel to me the way writing does. You know, I'm not able to... I can picture sort of what I want the music or the art to do and it doesn't happen. Sort of like you were saying to create with words, the pictures you can't make in painting. And I, I, I find that it's just so interesting of like these different values of modes of art or creative expression and, and the question of how much can you improve upon it or not. And, you know, it's, I, I don't think I'm ever gonna be, you know, charging people money for my, you know, fiddle CD, so. Not gonna not gonna hold my breath on that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I I felt as though I could see Joe's paintings, and um, uh, it 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 uh, it added a lot, an important dimension. Did I just see a? Yeah, this is actually something I was I was thinking about earlier. It's someone's asking about. Um, kind of the actual geography and landscapes of our books and noting that, you know, Larry, you write about Eastern Montana and I mostly write about Western Montana. So, you know, they're asking if we can talk about the geographical differences kind of in terms of how they impact the setting and characters. So, so, so tell us about writing Eastern Montana. Well, um, partly it's, uh, some of this is maybe has to do with claiming a territory. So when I first set a fiction in northeastern Montana, I felt as though um, maybe I could sort of make it mine um, 
you know, I mean, there are, there are certain parts of the country that, that are just owned by artists. I mean, I pity the, the Mississippi writer who's, who has to uh, write with William Faulkner on his shoulder or the New England poet who's got uh, the specter of Robert Frost to, to deal with. Um, so I thought I, could, I, th I thought I could get away with it. I also wanted to write about the part of Montana, the West, that wasn't pretty. I mean, that um, is true to what much of the West is. Um, so I've, I've sometimes said uh, only half facetiously that I don't write Westerns, I write Northerns. I write about that Northern part of, of the United States, the, the High Plains, the area near the, the Canadian border. And um, uh, I grew up in North Dakota, but people from that part of the world know that, that Eastern Montana and Western North Dakota are, are very similar in terms of, of the uh, flora and the fauna and, and, um, and the population. And by population, I mean, there is hardly any population. And, um, uh, but I knew at some point that to get that frontier Western feel into my fiction that I needed in some ways that Montana was, would provide it. And so um, that's, that's a big part of my reason for setting some fictions in, in Montana. I think, um, you know, even though I'm kind of writing about the Western Montana, which is sometimes the, you know, the pretty Montana, you know, I, I find that I kind of resist that to some extent, you know, I, I do think it is unbelievably gorgeous. And yet I write about the town that has a prison in it, or I write about the mining town that is failing. Um, and I think the juxtaposition of those things is very interesting to me. Sometimes when people ask about, you know, my first book, where did you get the idea? It's very hard for me to pin that down. But one of the things that comes to mind is, you know, when I did drive near Deer Lodge and just saw this sort of, you know, faceless prison juxtaposed against these huge mountains. I mean, it was just, it sort of just amplified this whole, like you've closed these people up in this tiny little place in this huge, vast landscape. Um, and it's weird. Um, and interesting. And so I, I do think there's something about that that interests me is, you know, these, these beautiful places that also have a side that, you know, people don't think about as much if they don't live there, perhaps. Um, and I'm interested in, you know, I mean, again, I, I just like writing gushy descriptions of mountains, let's be honest. Um, but I'm also, I also like kind of the claustrophobia that brings, you know, it's, it's sort of a extra layer to the, you know, someone who writes about small towns. It, it's kind of a physical representation sometimes for my characters of how they feel being somewhere where everyone knows them, everyone knows their history, um, everyone has expectations for them. You know, it lets me kind of explore that in the geography. Um, and some of it is, you know, I, I think, you know, perhaps similar to you, it's, it's the part I, I knew first, it's the part that feels familiar to me. I grew up in Spokane, Washington, um, and went to college at the University of Montana. And I remember when I made that decision, some people were surprised and they were kind of like, well, why don't you go, you know, to the University of Washington closer to home? And it's like, well, both geographically and sort of emotionally, Montana felt much closer to, you know, what I knew and what felt familiar to me than Western Washington does. Um, so some of it is, is simply having, you know, grown up somewhere where there are kind of mountains or mountains and then, you know, open spaces together and wanting to look at that, that more and see it more. And, and again, I think, you know, coming back to that idea of the myths, you know, and the ideas and the conceptions people have of the West. Mm -hmm. I like setting books somewhere where people do often think of it as the place rich people have their vacation homes um, and saying, well, what about the people who are there when the vacationers leave? You know, what does that look like? What is that experience like? And, and looking at a few of those and, and, and a few of those people and a few of those stories. Yeah, the, 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 the places where people who are from there can't afford to live there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and for sure, uh, state borders don't always represent um, the real divisions in, in the landscape very well. Um, um, I'm, I'm also interested in borders in the way that something 
can sometimes happen when you cross a border. Um, I think all, uh, many of us grew up with with warnings about borders. Oh, don't don't go over there. Um, you know, there are bad people over there, or uh, you're not going to be welcome if you go there. And um, and growing up in North Dakota, some of those warnings had to do with Montana. Uh, and um, and there's this notion that that the differences among the people, even even when they are close close by, is something that I'm I've been interested in exploring. And then you realize that there are some really really important differences among the people in communities, and this sometimes has to do with race. It has to do with might have to do with gender. Certainly has to do with social class. And um, I think once you start scraping away at some of those distinctions and differences, some some things reveal themselves. Uh, at least I've I've made some discoveries um, by trying to write some of those stories. That's interesting. When I when I first started thinking about writing Eden Mine, I thought it would be set in Idaho. Um, and a lot of my sort of initial research, which which probably shows, is you know was based in you know, Kellogg, Wallace, and a lot of the silver mining towns in North Idaho. Um, and I think at a certain point, I just, you know, some of it was was what you were speaking to earlier. Hey, I created this other place. I would kind of like to, you know, maybe I'm not done with it and I would like to revisit it. Um, and even maybe on some level, you know, not necessarily deliberately, I think I was also thinking, even in the publishing world, I was like, are people gonna want a Montana book more than an Idaho book, even if it's basically the same book? And I was like, they might, you know? <laughs> um, based on some of the some of the notes I get maybe from readers who aren't from the region. I'm like, I think the Montana idea just has this allure. And now it would be hard for me to envision it being set somewhere else because it came became so much of a Montana book for me. But again, that that question of borders is, is really interesting that you put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've, I've sometimes been asked by readers, could 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 this have happened someplace else? And it's it's a difficult question for me. Because of course, once you write the story in that place, that story has everything to do with that that place. So, if things were different, no, they couldn't be the same. That's always. I mean, that kind of feeds into this this thing that always fascinates me, which is like this idea of regional literature, and then of course you can parse that down to specific areas. You know, Montana literature, Eastern Montana literature, Western Montana literature. But it's always very interesting that you know. We, we, you know, that story set in Mississippi, right? We're going to call it Southern literature, the book in Montana, Western literature, the novel set in Maryland is very rarely like, ah, oh, yes, that fine example of mid-Atlantic literature. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I can, you know, expound professorially on all my theories about this, but, um, which I won't do, but, um, <laughs> It's, it's interesting to me that certain things kind of become, you know, by virtue of where they're set largely, although, you know, that we could, question whether there are other elements of those books that they get labeled in certain ways. It's a Southern book. It's a Western book. It's a Montana book. Okay. Um, a, a, a writer I admire enormously is Kathleen Shine, and many of her fictions are set in Manhattan. And But I don't think anyone ever says Kathleen Shine is a regional writer. <laughs> Yeah, the, the New York ones are kind of what always gets me that way. It's like we're all supposed to know where all the neighborhoods are and the streets are. And, and thanks to law and order, perhaps we do. But no, they're, they're very rarely labeled regional literature, for sure. I remember the first time I, I saw in a library when my first book came out that they put like a little cowboy boot sticker on the spine. And I was a little surprised. I was, I'm like, I'm okay with that. I, I like cowboy boots and own a lot of them. And, you know, my, my full DVD collection of Rawhide is getting me through this pandemic, I admit it. <laughs> but it, it, it sort of surprised me because I was like, I didn't write a Western. And then I've over time started to be like, well, did I? I'm, I'm you know, of, of two or more minds about that. But I, I still remember kind of realizing the degree to which that regional literature thing was still so prevalent when I saw my little cowboy boot sticker on it. Yeah. And of course, if a, a, a novel that doesn't seem to partake of, a, of any region, I think is probably going to be missing some really important ingredient. 
And it takes more than just a little cowboy boot on the, on the spine to make that happen. That's interesting to think about the ways, you know, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit today about these ideas about the West and kind of the real people who live there. And I see that now I, I teach at the University of Nevada in Reno. And, you know, I teach creative writing here and my students, some of them are like, I've, I've read a lot of casino stories in the workshops I teach, that's true. Um, but I've also, you know, read a lot of stories by the students who are just indignant that people think the only thing in Nevada is casinos yeah. um, and, you know, wanna show all of the other things around there. And I'm like, that's great. You need to like, you know, write your Nevada story, write your Nevada novel and, and show people, you know, what is here, what isn't here. And some of it's the casino and some of it's not. Do um, uh, you you had a, a, a Wisconsin sojourn too? Did didn't you? I did. I had a um, a fellowship after my MFA at the University of Wisconsin, their Institute for Creative Writing there, where they have one year fellowships for for people, and it was it was wonderful for me. Um, just in the timing, I had a you know my first book was my MFA thesis, so I had a very nice unwieldy. 125,000 word draft. Um, the published version is 80,000 words. So that tells you a bit about <laughs> my, I, I remember, you know, they got reviews where people were like, oh, not a wasted word. And it's like, oh, there were many wasted words. We just removed them before publication. So finally, finally learned that lesson. Um, but yeah, it was, it was my, my brief Midwestern time. And I still, this time of year, I always think about how I used to just I'm not much of a city person. I did like Madison, but I would have to get in my car and just go drive in the country. And I would just remember sort of like the relief and joy of seeing sort of the trees and the hills and this landscape that was very unfamiliar to me, but that I kind of loved immediately. Um, and also fireflies, which as much as I love the American West is perhaps its biggest flaw, the total absence of fireflies. I was just delighted to see those. So. So, so uh, did did you have a contract for your first novel while you were still you you were just you were still finishing or just finished your uh, MFA? Um, I didn't yet. I'd had a I'd had several agents contact me because they'd read a, you know one of my short stories um, and I got the do you have a novel you know question and I was like I have part of a novel um, and one of the agents actually offered to represent me then and I agonized over it and said no because I wanted to make sure whoever I went with was like okay with how I was planning to finish this book and he's actually now my agent so he gives me a hard time about like putting him off for like a year basically while deciding to do that so in Wisconsin it was I mean it was a great program you know we taught basically one undergrad class a semester um, and the rest of the time you were supposed to be finishing your book and I think that kind of time is depending on where you are in the process of, of writing can be either like a wonderful gift or sort of like a screaming void. Um, I've heard from people who kind of had that experience as well. But for me, it was great because I kind of knew what needed to happen. So I spent like the first semester kind of finishing the draft, signed with my agent who, you know, I was so proud of myself for having cut 25,000 words. And like the first thing he told me basically was, I think you need to cut 20,000 words from this manuscript. And, you know, I like sort of about died. Um, but we did that. And then it ended up, um, we sold it like two weeks after the fellowship ended. So it kind of was perfectly positioned for me. And I'm, you know, very grateful for that opportunity because I think, I think it would have taken me much longer to probably get that first book publication ready. Um, and the second one came about because, you know, during that first phone conversation with who is now my editor, um, Jenna Johnson, I was not prepared for the question, what are you working on now? I should have been but I wasn't. So I was all ready to talk about my first book. So I sort of mumbled something about this short story I'd been working on that was maybe bigger than a short story and tried to sound confident about it. And then the next day my agent was like, great news, you know, they would like to buy Black River and also the other novel you pitched. And I was kind of like, is that what I did? <laughs> um, so it, I did and I finally wrote it. Um, I did have a bit of the like second novel syndrome experience doing so I think in that it was, it was not so easy as the first one, which was not so easy in and of itself. But um, it was, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity to be sure. I uh, I had an experience that's somewhat similar to yours. I was uh, um, in the fiction writing program at the um, uh, University of Utah, working on my PhD and uh, working on a novel for my dissertation. 
And I sent uh, 50 pages off to be considered for a fellowship. I didn't get the fellowship, but one of the readers was somebody who had been an editor and was about to become an agent with William Morris. And he wrote to me and he said, do you have an agent? And if you don't, would you like me to represent you? And I said, I don't and shirk. <laughs> and he said, well, send me the, what you have. And I had maybe 100, 150 pages by then. Um, and he was able to uh, sell it to um, Scribner's and it was Scribner's back then, which should tell you how long ago it was. And, um, and so there it was, it was my dissertation, it was my first novel. And I thought, this looks like it's gonna be a pretty easy gig here. <laughs> you don't have to look for an agent, they find you, you don't have to finish the novel and they sell it already. And then for the next 13 years, I could not publish another novel. It got really, really hard. So when Montana 1948 was published, I didn't have a relationship with an agent or an editor. And I was worried that I'd never have another novel published, so. Yeah, sometimes, um, you know, the question, some of the events lately that, that feels to me like I get very defensive where they say, you know, what have you been working on during the pandemic? And my response is like, nothing. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure how much of that is the pandemic and how much of it is that just like sheer relief at having had this book finally get done and be published and exist in the real world. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it and I'm, I'm happy with it, but there are like 30 manuscript boxes in my apartment with various revisions in it. And the thought of, of sort of embarking upon that immediately again is, is a bit overwhelming, even though I I do kind of have an idea for for the next book i almost essentially the day it was finally like you know done and accepted and the manuscript was like okay there i was you know i had about 24 hours of i never want to write another book and the next day of like well maybe i should buy a notebook to just make notes for book three so <laughs> yeah yeah i i've said many times if i finish a book on on tuesday i'll start another one on wednesday but the truth is i've probably started weeks or months before then at least at least thinking about it. And then maybe that book that I start on Wednesday, I'll abandon on Friday. <laughs> that's, that's happened too. Yeah. I can't tell if we have questions. Can you? No, no, I'm not sure. I was trying to scan over here and see. Doesn't look like it. Oh, no questions. No questions. All right. We're just fascinating all by ourselves. <laughs> It's true, you guys are fascinating all by yourselves. <laughs> it's been, yeah, someone else agreed. They said you were both delightful. Um, well, it's been a pleasure having you both here today and just speaking about your experiences in the West and what that means to you and sharing your works with us. Um, I'd like to thank both Sarah Hulse and Larry Watson and congratulations on Eden Mine and the live of Ed in the lives of Edie Pritchard, excuse me. Thank you again to our sponsors, The Whitefish Review, and thank you to everyone watching. You've been a great audience. If you have any questions, now would be the time because we're, <laughs> we're wrapping up. All right. Um, also, I just would like to remind everyone that you can purchase books by these authors. <laughs> You can purchase books by these authors at Fact and Fiction's website, factandfictionbooks.com. I also urge you to purchase Montana Book Festival merchandise at montanabookfestival.com. There you can also donate so that we can continue our programming after the festival with our Montana Book Festival Plus events. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Have a wonderful weekend. And thank you again, Larry and Sarah. It's been a pleasure. Bye. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.